Welcome to our Timely Topics webinar, Separating the Facts from the Fake, featuring Professor Jenny Dale from UNC Greensboro. I'm Diana Wynn, President of the League of Women Voters of Wake County. I have just a few announcements regarding upcoming league activities and events that you may be interested in. We have some members only events coming up that may interest many of our leaguers. On March 22nd, we'll host a virtual tea in celebration of Women's History Month. And on March 29th, we'll have a fun social event involving a virtual treasure hunt that will be done via Zoom. This will be a fun opportunity to get to know fellow members of the Wake League. Our next DEI roundtable discussion is March 23rd, and we'll discuss the topic of defunding the police and what that might mean. All our DEI roundtable discussions are open to any league member in North Carolina. On March 31st, we will have a special webinar on using Twitter as a tool for advocacy. This webinar is also open to all league members in the state. Our next Timely Topics webinar is April 15th, and will feature Karen Brinson Bell, the Executive Director for the State Board of Elections, and she'll be discussing what we learned from the 2020 elections and what to expect in future elections. Our Timely Topics webinars are always open to the public, and you can find more information about all of our activities and events at lwvwake.org. And if you're not already a member of the League, you can join us online at our website. Before we get started, I want to briefly explain how we're using the Zoom platform for this webinar. Except for the presenters, everyone is muted and you're not on video. We're not using the chat feature in Zoom today. Instead, please type your questions in the Q&A screen. Our moderators will be monitoring the Q&A screen throughout the presentation. At the end of the presentation, the speaker will be asked your questions and we'll try to get to as many of your present uh, as many of your questions as we can. Please don't wait until the end of the presentation to submit your questions. It's much easier for the moderator if she can see that uh, throughout the presentation rather than all at once at the end. Cheryl Keaton, our Timely Topics Committee co-chair, will monitor the questions submitted and will serve as our moderator for the Q and a segment. This webinar is being recorded and in the next few days will appear on LWV Wake's YouTube channel. I'd now like to turn the program over to our other Timely Topics Committee co-chair, Diane Pyan, who will introduce our speaker. Hello everyone and thank you for coming to tonight's monthly Timely Topics webinar. Many of us are asking ourselves, what in the world is going on in social media and the multitudes of streaming services that we use today? Can we trust our sources? Our guest tonight shares these concerns and may shed light on what's happening. Jenny Dale comes to us as an associate professor and information literacy coordinator at UNC Greenboro, Greensboro's University Libraries. She is a native of North Carolina. She has her BA in English and her MS in Library Science from UNC Chapel Hill. She has spent her career helping learners of all ages develop the skills they need to locate, access, evaluate, and most importantly, ethically use that information. Welcome to our program tonight, Jenny Dale, and thank you so much for being here. All right, thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, my presentation um, is through Google Slides and I did wanna let everyone know before I start that I did just get uh, several tornado warnings um, on my phone. So hopefully the, nothing bad will happen, um, but if, if I suddenly disappear, hopefully I'll be able to get back. But uh, yes, so I'm talking tonight about separating the facts from the fake. Uh, and I am Jenny Dale, as you have heard. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Information Literacy Coordinator at UNCG University Libraries. Um, if you can see my Zoom background, it is Jackson Library at UNC uh, Greensboro. And um, 
it's a lot prettier in the Zoom background than I imagine it is today. So thank you all so much for joining me today. And I will be sharing these slides. They're a bit content heavy. So I just wanted to, to let folks know that these slides will be shared if you want to review any of the content or links or resources later on. So my goals for this talk, I wanna spend a little bit of time defining some key terms. I want to explore one particular approach that I use for on evaluating online sources and one that I teach a lot to my UNCG students uh, and to other groups that I work with. Um, and then I want to help you identify some freely available source evaluation and fact checking resources. And I have some resources that I'll share with you that you can kind of take with you and look back at later. So starting with defining some key terms. So you've heard information literacy mentioned a couple of times, mostly because it's in my title. Um, so I wanted to give you sort of a definition, a working definition of what that actually means. Um, so I use the definition from the Association of College and Research Libraries, which is a professional organization for academic librarians like me. Um, and their definition of information literacy is what you see here on the screen. It's the set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, the understanding of how information is produced and valued, and the use of information in creating new knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. So I've, I've the emphasis here, the bold text is my own. Um, this, some of the things that I think are most important about this definition. Um, this is really focused again, since this is the Association of College and Research Libraries, it's really written with the idea of sort of college students in mind. But I think that all of these skills are really important, sort of lifelong learning kind of skills. We are all, um, as, as you heard in the introduction from Diane, we're all you know getting information on social media, through streaming services, through websites. We all have to deal with information all the time and having the skills that we need to be able to discover that information and also to really kind of understand how it gets to us and how we can evaluate it is, is such an important set of skills for anyone um, well beyond sort of our, our college students, although that's that's often my focus. So I have a little word cloud here that I made from um, an article called Information Literacy and Fake News, How the Field of Librarianship Can Help Combat the Epidemic of Fake News from 2020. Um, and I created this um, from the text of that article because I wanted to give you a sense of what all information literacy sort of overlaps with or connects with in terms of some of the public discourse that we have around information. So you can see information literacy and librarian, those are our two biggest ones here, but you also see some concepts that I'm sure are familiar to you, like fake news, news, misinformation, evaluation, facts, citations, social media, media in general, uh, lots of um, different things that I am sure you come across constantly in your own day-to-day -day lives. So I do think information literacy has lots and lots of connections to all of our sort of daily information journeys. Um, but particularly tonight, we're gonna to be talking about issues related to misinformation and disinformation. So I'm gonna start with a definition of misinformation. Um, and misinformation is, um, uh, misinformation and disinformation, I see them used interchangeably, particularly in the media. And so one of the things I want you to kind of pay attention to here are the differences in these two definitions. So uh, I get pretty much all of my uh, definitions from the Oxford English Dictionary because it's my favorite dictionary. Um, and as a librarian, I am allowed to have one of those. I'm allowed to have a favorite dictionary. It's a comprehensive dictionary of the English language, which includes lots of etymology and word history. Um, and so the way they, they uh, define misinformation is two things here. The action of misinforming someone, the condition of being misinformed, or, and the second one is a little more relevant to us today, wrong or misleading information. And this is not any in any way a new concept. So actually the first recorded use of the word misinformation in the Oxford English Dictionary was in 1587. So we're not talking about any kind of new phenomenon here. So we switch over to disinformation, again, from my favorite dictionary. Uh, it is the dissemination of deliberately false information, especially when supplied by a government or its agent to a foreign power or to the media with the intention of influencing the policies or opinions of those who receive it or false information so supplied. So 
as you have probably seen a pattern already, I like to, to tell you when these words sort of came into being. Um, and the first recorded use of disinformation in the Oxford English Dictionary was in 1955. So much more recently than that 1587 misinformation definition. Um, but uh, still, I think a, a little bit I don't want to say out of date, but but not quite as accurate, I think, for the way that we see. Oh, <laughs> sorry if y'all can see that. Okay. Um, UNCG is very serious about our safety. Um, okay, so uh, 1955, I just want you to take a minute and think about what was happening in the world in 1955 when this sort of initial definition would have been formulated. And I want you to also think for a moment about whether this definition as it's written is still applicable to us in 2021. So I'm gonna give you just a moment to think and then I'm gonna tell you my thoughts. And hopefully we won't have another one of those uh, terrifying emergency alerts come up. Okay, so hopefully you've had a moment to think about it. Um, so when I think about 1955, I, I was not alive in 1955, but when I think about it from a historical perspective, I think of the Cold War and I think about disinformation campaigns being launched by governments, um, particularly as this uh, definition mentions, um, using the media. To me, what's different in 2021, I mean, that's still happening. You know, that's still something governments still do launch disinformation campaigns. Um, the media is still involved, but I think what's really different now um, is that we don't, um, we have like, there's such, there's been such a proliferation of different media sources, including participatory options like social media. So we no longer have to have a disinformation campaign that kind of comes from above and goes through these sort of uh, mediated channels. We could, you know, share things on social media and that is something that, that allows disinformation as well as misinformation um, to spread a lot more easily. So to me, you know, a lot of this is still holds true, but it is not quite as limited to the agents that you see here in this definition. So when you think about disinformation and misinformation, what's the difference? Like I said, these are often used interchangeably, um, but I don't think they're interchangeable words. I think we can group disinformation under misinformation, but to me, the big difference is that disinformation has intent. So if we pop back over here to our definition, it's the dissemination of deliberately false information. So there's a deliberateness that we don't see in this wrong or misleading information definition from misinformation. So there's got to be sort of an intent behind something to call it disinformation. So thinking about where we might see examples of these in our information ecosystem, I think one of the things that we hear talked about a lot related to both misinformation and disinformation is fake news. Um, deep fakes, these are two things we're gonna talk a little bit about tonight, but there are a lot of other applications of these just in the sort of information world that we go through every day. So I wanna give you a definition of fake news um, again from my favorite dictionary. Um, originally US news that conveys or incorporates false, fabricated or deliberately misleading information or that's characterized as or accused of doing so. So to me, there's two really important things in that definition that connect back to what we've already talked about. One, you see that word deliberately is in there. So again, I would say fake news, if it is uh, of that first part of the definition, if it meets that false, fabricated or deliberately misleading information, then it's more likely to be disinformation. Um, the second part of that definition is important because one of the things that we have heard um, happen over the last uh, few years in particular, we've heard uh, like major figures, media figures, political figures, celebrities, we have heard people characterize certain uh, publications or journalists as being sort of purveyors of fake news. Um, so even if they aren't providing this false fabricated or deliberately misleading information, we see them being characterized as characterized as or accused of doing that. And that sort of all gets tied up into our sort of concepts and questions and anxieties about what fake news is. So as I said, these slides will be available. And if you're a like, history person, I definitely recommend taking a look at some of the links I have on this slide um, because fake news is not a new concept at all. Um, I, I would say probably the first time I heard it 
called fake news was probably in the lead up to the 2016 presidential election. I think the first person I had ever heard use that term was, was President Obama. Um, but it has a really long and interesting history, particularly in the US. Um, it just hadn't sort of been part of our national vocabulary or part of our sort of national attention until we started talking about it a lot more during that presidential election and have continued to talk about it since then. But actually the first recorded mention of it is from a, an 1890 Milwaukee Daily Journal article. And again, if you're interested in history stuff, I also recommend looking at some of the 19th century moon hoax uh, fake news that came out. There was this whole series um, of newspaper stories that were um, published about life on the moon. So if you're into that kind of thing, definitely look into it. So those are, that's kind of our definition of fake news, our working definition. But I want to talk a little bit about where we actually are with fake news in the United States, because I'm sure that like many of you, um, or that I, like many of you, I'm sure you've heard lots of people talking about fake news over these last few years. I hear a lot of anxiety about it from professors at UNCG, from students at UNCG, from community members when I talk to people. Um, and I think part of the, part of what happens in terms of bringing that anxiety uh, to the forefront is that we're talking about this a lot more. So I wanted to give you some, some reassurance, hopefully. Um, this is a pretty recent study from the journal Science Advances. It was published in April of 2020. Um, and what they found in this particular study is that fake news consumption is a negligible fraction of Americans' daily information diet. So that's, that's a good thing. That's good news there. And they really used very, in the study, very broad definitions of news, of fake news, and of media. So they um, use a, in terms of news, like they say here on this slide, they talked about news sites, news publications, uh, news, you know, uh, news networks. They also talked about sort of newsy type things like morning shows or sort of portals that just kind of link you out to different news sources. And their definition of fake news included both those sort of outright deliberately fraudulent sites, as well as news sources that are considered highly biased or hyperpartisan. So they're even with using these very sort of broad definitions, um, they were still finding that it's it, this is a tiny fraction of what we're actually coming across most of us um, as Americans in terms of our news kind of information diet, as they say here. Um, and so this is a reference to a figure that is in this study. And, and again, this, this should be a freely available um, study. So I do have it linked here in my slides. Um, what they did find was that older viewers were heavier consumers than younger viewers in terms of finding fake news or fake media, which is consistent with other findings that have come up in the last few years about misinformation and fake news. Um, but regardless, even those heavier users still spent less than an average of a minute per day engaging with fake news. And for none of the users or participants in the study, um, did, none of them spent more than or used one, more than 1% of their overall news consumption for fake news or 0.2% of their overall media consumption. So again, we're actually talking about a negligible amount that we are encountering, but it is something that for many of us, particularly in the United States, we're very worried about, and here's some uh, some more about that. So a sample of US adults uh, was asked in a poll by Monmouth University Polling Institute, one of the major polling institutes that's out there. Um, it was actually part of a coronavirus poll in June of 2020. Um, and they asked their sample, do you think outside groups or agents are actively trying to plant fake news stories on social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube? Or is this not happening? And then as a follow-up, is this a serious or not too serious problem? And 68% of their respondents said, yes, this is happening and it's a serious problem. Another 16%, so we're at 84% of people who responded to this basically saying, I do think that there are agents or groups actively trying to plant this kind of content on social media sites. But that 16% wasn't like too worried about it. 10% didn't think it was happening at all, 6% said they didn't know. So what we're seeing here, I think, is a bit of a tension between what we saw in that study I just shared about the actual consumption of fake news 
and the anxiety that people have about fake news. And this is just another sort of continuation of that thought. Another sort of major uh, polling and research organization, Gallup, worked with the Knight Foundation on a study, and they found that four in five Americans, this was a little bit later in summer of 2020, but four in five Americans were concerned, either very concerned or somewhat, that misinformation on social media could sway the outcome of the presidential election. And that's, a, that's something that is, it reasonably could cause a lot of anxiety if that's something you're truly worried about. So if you're worried about, again, back in this Monmouth poll, if you're worried about these groups kind of actively sowing misinformation and disinformation on social media sites, and you're worried to the extent that you think it might actually impact the presidential election, which is something that you know has an impact on everyone in this country, it's understandable that we would have anxiety about this and, and we might not feel you know super relieved to hear that we are still not actually encountering a whole lot of this because we do hear these stories about um, you know, what happens when people do believe things that we find out are misinformation or disinformation or fake news um, and take action based on those. Another thing I wanted to mention are uh, deep fakes and cheap fakes. Um, so uh, there is a, a, an interesting report that Paris and Donovan wrote for Data and Society about deep fakes and cheap fakes. Um, and one of the things that they point out here is that deep fakes, which for something to truly be a deep fake, it has to be um, an, an artificial intelligence uh, technique used to create it. And we see this in like film level deep fakes. So if you saw the uh, most recent, you know, Star Wars film um, where they used lots of very convincing footage of Carrie Fisher after she had already unfortunately passed away. Those are the kind of like they're those kind of technologies are run by artificial intelligence. Most deep fakes that we would come across through social media or might be shared through sort of news sources are not that sophisticated. But these two authors talk about those deep fakes being just one sort of component of a much larger field of what they call audiovisual manipulation. So there's those AI reliant deep fakes, but they also talk about these things called cheap fakes, which I've also heard called shallow fakes that use sort of very conventional techniques like speeding, slowing, cutting, restaging, or recontextualizing footage, or I would argue also just images that are um, that don't require like you to have massive uh, you know computer science knowledge that you could use with some sort of basic softwares. So an example of this. Um, is I'm sure many of you are familiar with the sort of uh, deep fake video or cheap fake, they would call it, Paris and Donovan would call it, of Nancy Pelosi um, giving a speech and where it appeared that she was inebriated. Um, and it was shared a lot, it really went viral. Um, and what happened in that, if you're not familiar with that, was that it was actually just a regular video speech slowed to 75%. So it made her appear to be speaking really slowly, almost like she was slurring her words. Um, and that was something that with just sort of a click, someone took a video, manipulated it very basically, and sort of sent it out as sort of recontextualized footage that was inaccurate in the way that it presented things. And it was clear, you know, most news organizations were like, this is definitely um, not uh, an accurate video. Every if, if, you know, Nancy Pelosi had given a public speech while she was intoxicated, I think we would have heard about it on every major news network um, and every major publication. But that's just an example of one of those cheap fakes. So I've got a couple of things on this screen. The one on the left, if you are familiar with the social media platform, Snapchat. Um, one of the things that people love about Snapchat is uh, their face swapping technology. And this is technically a deep fake technology. But you can see here from these images, you know, most of the time it's not, uh, it's not full like cinematic level seamless uh, face swapping. So you can see some of the weird ones here, uh, parent and a little kid, but also we have like someone trying to uh, swap with their cat, someone swapping with a Lego head, someone swapping with a surge protector. Um, so this is still deep fit technology. Um, that some of these other sort of more sophisticated uh, deep fakes would rely on. Um, but we can see here, I think we can probably all agree that that's just for fun. 
Um, no one is trying to make you believe that this guy and his cat have actually switched faces. On the right, a little more uncanny, and again, this is sort of that uh, like Hollywood film level of deep fakes, is we see on the left side, uh, actress Amy Adams in the film Man of Steel, and then on the right side, we see uh, her face has been swapped with Nicolas Cage. Um, and it's like kind of creepy and uncanny. And for some reason, um, Nicolas Cage is a very popular subject of deep fakes. People have put him um, in as Maria in The Sound of Music. I have seen him, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones, but they like, to me, this is kind of uh, fascinating how seamlessly his face um, has been inserted here. But again, at no point is anyone going to try to convince you that, oh, actually Lois Lane in Man of Steel was played by Nicolas Cage. That's not really the intent. So when we think about these kinds of examples of deep or cheap fakes, and we compare them to things that came up in the months leading up to the 2020 presidential election. So I've got two examples here. One is um, a tweet that relies exclusively on visual manipulation and primarily does it through recon recontextualization. So this tweet over here on the left um, shows uh, Kayleigh McEnany, um, President Trump's, uh, at that time she was the uh, uh, press secretary, I guess. Now I'm trying to think about what her title was. Um, but she handed Leslie Stahl, who was there at the White House to um, interview President Trump, this big book about the administration's, the Trump administration's work on healthcare. And the person who um, put this together, did this kind of zoom in on the book, and just it makes it look like the page that she has opened to is blank. Um, and their sort of suggestion here is that the whole book is blank. This big giant book is just full of blank pages, um, which is, of course, not the case. That would not have happened. Um, but this got a lot of traction. It got shared a lot on Twitter. Again, it's super easy to share these kind of things. And then on the right, this one is more, again, a, a more sophisticated, like I would say the left is something we could call a cheap fake. It's just sort of taken out of context and um, given like this information to contextualize it that's not accurate. On the right, <laughs> st still a tornado warning. Um, sorry about that. On the right, we have this video that some of you may have seen or heard about, which purported to be a video of um, uh, at the time, candidate Joe Biden um, falling asleep while being interviewed by a television anchor. Um, and this one was like, I would say this is more in deep fake territory. It took some real technology and some sort of AI skills to be able to make this happen. Um, so when we think about these two things, again, leading up to an election that put these two candidates against each other, the difference between these sort of fun, weird Nick Cage deep fakes and, this, and the Snapchat face swapping and this uh, out of context tweet and image and then this uh, deep faked video of Joe Biden. Um, to me, again, if we think back to misinformation and disinformation, to me, the difference is intent. So the intent I think here is to entertain, to make you laugh, to make you think, oh, it's so weird to see, you know, Nick Cage's face on Amy Adams. Um, but here, I think the intent is to harm, to harm someone reputa someone's reputation, particularly, again, we have these two um, really important political figures at the time. So that's the other thing that I think we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about deep fakes. And the anxiety around fake news is very sort of similar, I think, in um, in terms of impact is the anxiety around these deep fakes. So recently there have been lots of articles um, and news stories that have come out about this TikTok user um, who does Tom Cruise deep fakes and has all these like, I mean, they're pretty flawless. It looks just like Tom Cruise and he's doing stuff like magic tricks. Um, so there's been a lot of coverage of him. Um, but most of the time when we see these sort of deep fake related news headlines, they're like a lot more terrifying than what we see here. So we see deep fakes are gonna wreak havoc on society and we're not prepared. Seeing is no longer believing inside the Pentagon's race against deep fake videos. This is from The Economist, could deep fakes weaken democracy? Uh, deep fakes are coming, we can no longer believe what we see. Microsoft takes on deep fakes, stop election disinformation. And finally, this one, which is like very intense, politicians fear this like fire, the rise of the deep fake and the threat to democracy. So again, 
we see this high level of anxiety. How do I know that I can trust what I see? If anyone can um, easily recontextualize an image, if anyone can update or change a video and make it look like whatever they want it to, how can I believe anything? Um, and one of the reasons I think our anxiety is so high about these things right now is because one of the things that Paris and Donovan talk about in that data and society report about deep fakes and cheap fakes, again, they're saying these aren't new things, these ideas of media manipulation. Media manipulation has happened as long as there has been media. But they talk about sort of two major sort of phenomena right now that make it easier for these things to happen, particularly in terms of those deep fakes. And the first one is uh, that we tend to share a lot more. We share videos, we share images of ourselves. It's gonna be a bit easier for um, someone who is kind of looking through all that to be able to potentially sort of use that content that's out there to create deep fakes, to digitize bodies and voices and faces and likenesses. So one thing you can do if you are anxious about deep fakes is to try to make sure that you've got all your privacy settings all tightened up on any social media that you have and be sort of careful about what you might be sharing. And then to me, the second one is the most important thing. No matter what these manipulations are, whether it's deep fakes, cheap fakes, fake news, whatever, they can be transmitted, as they say, at the speed and scale of today's online platforms. Super easy to share this kind of stuff. Um, and that, again, is, I think, why we see this increased sort of anxiety about what we're coming across, particularly on social media, and whether it's true or real or not. So to me, one of the most important things you can do is to really get confident in your own online evaluation skills. So evaluating online information is sort of one thing that you can do that can be both sort of your responsibility, um, but is also sort of a way that you can uh, be more proactive about dealing with these kinds of things that you might come across. And I wanna talk a little bit about this approach called four moves and a habit. Um, so this is an approach that I really like to teach because it centers behaviors and habits of mind. It doesn't say, okay, here's a checklist of things to look for and decide if a source is good. It really is encouraging you to, um, again, sort of proactively engage in some behaviors that I think are very helpful in terms of navigating this sort of online information world. And it was proposed by Mike Caulfield, who is at Washington State University and is a really widely respected digital literacy expert. Um, and he has a free online textbook that is called Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers. Um, and I know it's a student in there, so don't let that, you know, turn you away from this book. I think we're all students of life, but he also has a tagline, I think, in the book that says, for student fact checkers and other people who like facts. So hopefully all of us here are people who like facts. So I wanna break this down a little bit. His four moves are number one, to look for previous work. And we're gonna go through each one of these. Two, to go upstream. Three, to read laterally. And four, to circle back. And so let's go in a little bit more depth with these. One of the things that I like here about um, Caulfield's approach, again, he has this sort of habit of mind and that habit that he says you've got to really hone in on is checking your emotions. And here is a quote from chapter three in that textbook. When you feel strong emotion, happiness, anger, pride, vindication, really anything that you have sort of strong emotional response to, and that's the thing that's pushing you to share something with others, particularly on social media, you, you must sort of stop. That's gotta be your habit, to stop and check your emotions. And he says, above all, these are the claims that you must fact check because it's a lot easier for us to um, feel comfortable sharing something if we have had a strong emotional response to it, whether it's a positive one or a negative one. So I wanna take a quick detour here and talk about confirmation bias. So in case you thought that we were done with the Oxford English Dictionary, we're not. Um, confirmation bias is a psychology term, um, and it is the tendency to seek or favor new information, which supports one's existing theories or beliefs, while avoiding or rejecting that which disrupts them. So when we're looking at this definition, it's just kind of human nature. This is how we, how we work as humans. We seek out information that fits into uh, 
our framework of what we value, what we believe in, what we know to be true about the world. And we tend to avoid or reject things that disrupt that. And sort of confronting our own confirmation biases is a really important thing that we can do to make sure that we feel good about our ability to navigate through these sort of this potential sort of fake news, deep fake, um, you know, super biased kind of information that we might come across. So I'll just give you a quick sort of non-political example here. There are lots of political confirmation biases, but here's an example from me. Um, if I am a dedicated coffee drinker, which I am, um, my parents and my in-laws are both here tonight and they can all attest to this, love coffee. I just did this quick search last week on Google News and I came across these three different articles about coffee. Black coffee can be good for your heart studies show, which is from CNN. Uh, studies show caffeinated coffee can reduce risk of heart failure from some sort of local sort of radio station. And then the third one, drinking coffee may temporarily impair this brain function, new study says. And so sort of regardless of how I feel about these sources, I'm only, you know, I haven't really, I'm not familiar with the second or the third. I have certainly heard of CNN. Um, but regardless of how I might feel about the sources, my confirmation bias is going to make me a lot less likely to click the third one. Because if drinking coffee is a part of my day, if it's something that I, um, you know, have, like, again, if it's something that I would consider sort of part of my life and what I do and some of the choices that I make on a day to day basis, I'm probably not going to be drawn to reading this article about how it may impair one of my brain functions because I don't want to know. To me, that's the most important reason to look at that source. Um, so one of the things that we have to do is really sort of confront our own confirmation biases about the things that we come across. And again, some of them are going to be political. Some of them are going to relate to other values or other things that we um, have as part of our lives. Um, but we've got to make sure that we are really choosing the best information and also trying to bring in some other perspectives, even on topics that we might feel really strongly about. Okay, moving back into Caulfield and his four moves. The first move is to look for previous work. Um, and this is, uh, I really like this part of Caulfield's um, sort of four moves framework, because as he, he makes this point that when you're looking at a particular claim, or a quote or an article or a you know headline or whatever, um, the easiest thing that you could do is actually just see if someone else has already investigated it. Um, because we have lots and lots of fact checking sites that are out there. You can find like to explore those and see which ones you trust, which ones you feel good about. Um, there are other sort of uh, ways to look for previous work. One of the things that he recommends, um, and students are always kind of shocked when I recommend this as well, is to use Wikipedia. Um, and one of the reasons is that when we, uh, when you create a Wikipedia page or when you edit a Wikipedia page, they actually have very stringent rules about how you source the information that you share there. So you're going to have to put some kind of citation or else they're going to flag it as not having proper citations. Um, authors are required to adopt what they call in Wikipedia a neutral point of view. Um, so these can be really good introductions to sources. And they're also really good places, we'll talk more about this in a moment, really good places to understand um, the perspective of different organizations and publications that you might come across in sort of your uh, information journeys. So the second move is to go upstream. And he says to do this if uh, move one wasn't sufficient in terms of figuring it out. So if, if you've gone through move one and you have looked at several other fact-checking sites and other news organizations and you find that you know what you the claim you're looking at does seem to be true, then you may not need to go upstream. But often you will. You'll need to keep going in this sort of framework. So going upstream he can mean finding the original source. I'm sure many of you have come across this, um, especially online. Um, there's, besides the sort of major news outlets and major papers, there are a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of original reporting. So we get a lot of things that are from the Associated Press or from Reuters, from other news wires that just get sort of uh, republished by organizations. And that's just part of how our sort of news ecosystem works in the United States. Um, so if you can trace it back to the original story, it's going to be easier for you to be able to do this fact checking and sort of figuring out where the information came from. 
Going upstream can also mean identifying sponsored content, which I would say is getting harder and harder to do uh, with websites like very seamlessly integrating sponsored content into their sites and making it look like they're articles when they're actually ads. And then this third thing here, tracking the source of viral content, memes, images, videos, those kinds of things, you can go upstream. You could use a tool like Google's reverse image search, which actually helps you determine where an image initially came from, which is a good sort of fact checking tool when you're dealing with something that might be uh, visual in nature. Move three is my personal favorite. Um, I teach this strategy a lot. I present on this a lot and it's reading laterally. So there was a report in 2017 that was published by the Stanford History Education Group. Um, and the researchers who engaged in this report um, basically compared the evaluation skills of three groups, professional fact checkers, like most of the people who work for newspapers and news organizations, professional PhD holding historians, and Stanford undergraduate students. Um, and it's interesting the uh, what they found in the study, and I have a link here to some news coverage of it, as well as a link later to the study itself, the fact checkers were by far the fastest and the most accurate. While the PhD historians, you know, highly educated people and those Stanford undergraduate students, I mean, I think of Stanford as very fancy sort of, you know, high quality school. Um, they were, those two groups were really easily deceived by unreliable sources, as long as they looked nice and professional, as long as they presented themselves well. Um, whereas again, the fact checkers, what they did very quickly is use what the authors ended up calling lateral reading skills. So they left the source in order to investigate the source. They didn't just take the source's word for it about what they, uh, you know, what their mission was or sort of who they were, who was behind it. So let's do a little uh, lateral reading example here so I can show you a way that I might teach this in a class and how I might encourage you to engage in lateral reading. Um, so, you know, there was a lot recently in the news about a proposed $15 minimum wage, and there has been, you know, periodically over the years, um, but just this was, I think, two weeks ago that I thought, okay, well, let me just see what's out there about this. Periodically, I like to do that because I like to be prepared to help students um, who are researching these sort of pers for persuasive speeches or argumentative papers or things like that. Um, to these very common topics and minimum wage is one that students in colleges, from my experience, like to research a lot and argue about. Um, so I came across this site called Faces of 15 and I'm going to pop over to that site so that you can see it. Um, Faces of 15, uh, Consequences of Minimum Wage Hikes, and this is a very like professional, really nice looking website. We've got lots of good quality photography here. Like I, I don't see any issues that might make me question, um, you know, based on like grammar or spelling errors. I don't see a lot of issues. As I go down here, I see these really high quality, high production value video stories. Um, I see this interactive map of different businesses that have been affected negatively by an increased minimum wage. And then I can even go to some of these specific ones, none in North Carolina. Um, you can see they're pretty concentrated West Coast and uh, Northeast. Um, but these are sort of uh, video stories or text-based text stories about how businesses and business owners and workers have been negatively impacted by an increased minimum wage. So if I just stay on the site itself, um, that's the only perspective I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see, wow, look at all these people who've had all these negative impacts from an increased minimum wage. Um, so what I need to do and need to get in the habit of doing is reading laterally. And what I can do here, I can scroll all the way down. Sorry, that was disorienting. And I see about Faces of 15 down here. And it tells me that Faces of 15 is a project of the Employment Policies Institute and minimumwage.com. The minimumwage.com is a source I'm familiar with because again, I see a lot of students using it. But the Employment Policies Institute, if I go over to their website and I go to their About Us page, which is usually what we're taught to do. Um, and this is kind of what uh, experts would call vertical reading. We stay within the site, we read what they say about themselves um, and we make some decisions about whether or not to sort of take their word for it. So there's some kind of you know, bland, neutral language here. 
Uh, founded in 1991, the Employment Policies Institute is a nonprofit research organization dedicated to studying public policy issues surrounding employment growth. Uh, in particular, it focuses on issues that affect entry level employment. So they don't say anything here in that first part about the minimum wage, even though we already know that they sort of deal with that. So what that makes me want to do is do some lateral reading. So I would uh, go ahead and Google the Employment Policies Institute. Uh, spelling is just atrocious today. Um, and I'm seeing first things that they have, again, promoted, and that's not lateral reading. That would be vertical reading if I just stuck within their site. So what I'm going to do, like I said, some Wikipedia-ing right here. Um, so I can see right away from this, they are really, really wanting us to stay protected here. Um, but it has expired, so it's now safe for me to leave my shelter area. Uh, it's a fiscally conservative nonprofit American think tank that conducts and publishes research on employment issues, particularly aimed towards reducing the minimum wage. Now, that's a lot more helpful and a lot more specific than the language they use on their own about page. And this is very common when we look at something like Wikipedia or when I come back here, sometimes you'll come across these sites like Sourcewatch, or it's actually pretty common that you start to see. Um, other news publications and other sort of uh, resources talking about a particular organization or publication, this is where we can start to paint a more accurate sort of broader picture of what we are actually coming across when we look at something created by the Employment Policies Institute. So I am not suggesting that uh, not not to, this is not a value judgment. This is not me saying, oh, they're you know they're definitely lying. But what's important for me to know here is that if I'm looking at their faces of 15 and I'm getting really taken in by some of those sort of emotional videos and seeing how this has impacted people, um, it helps me to understand that this organization has actually been dedicated to reducing the minimum wage. So they're they're not going to provide. It's not in their best interest to provide positive stories about an increased minimum wage, right? And so again, you can make decisions about what that means to you, but it's important to know that this is going to impact the way that they present information. And so that takes me to um, this sort of what, what Caulfield says about lateral reading and why it's important. Um, it helps the reader understand both the perspective from which the site's analyses come and if the site has an editorial process or expert reputation that would allow one to accept the truth of a site's facts. Um, and this is particularly the case when you research a publication, um, a publication that you might not be familiar with. This can be really helpful in sort of understanding, okay, is this more like a blogging platform or is there something, does it go through a fact check? Does it go through a specific kind of process? Um, and from there, I just want to have a note on bias. We talked about confirmation bias, um, but I want to talk a little bit about bias in sources. Um, we'll never be able to avoid bias. We all have our biases. As, as far as like right now, all sources are written by people. and People have biases. Um, and particularly, that's going to be the case with things found online. So what I encourage you to consider, though, is the degree of bias and whether or not you think that degree of that bias is strong enough to compromise any accuracy of the information provided. So from my perspective, and again, this is subjective, it's my sort of personal decision here, when I learn that the um, Employment Policies Institute has been dedicated to reducing the minimum wage, to me, that's going to compromise what I see um, on that faces of 15 site, because I'm going to think, well, what, whose stories are they leaving out here? What, what would happen if uh, there was an increased minimum wage and something really good happened that they're not sharing? So if you decide that you want to use a source that has a clear bias, which happens all the time, another thing that you can do is try to find a source that takes a different approach. And that can just help you fill in some gaps. And if you have heard of this concept of filter bubbles where we get kind of stuck in these information echo chambers when we go to the same sites and sources and we go to the same, um, you know, like when we click on the same news sources all the time, we just start to see that coming back up and what's recommended to us. Um, you can look at a source that takes a different approach. I have a link here to a resource that I like called All Sides. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is they the way that they do this is they take a news item 
So this one, Biden administration to send 4 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine to Canada and Mexico. And you can see how an organization, a news organization they have identified as being right-leaning, the New York Post, um, how an, a center, uh, center-leaning organization like Reuters and a left-leaning organization that they have here listed as New York Times. You can see how those three different news organizations cover the same story. And that, again, can help you fill in some gaps and get some different perspectives, which we don't always want to do, again, because of confirmation bias, um, but which is a really powerful tool in feeling you know, really confident about what you're consuming in terms of the news. And then finally, that fourth move is to circle back. And this is, if you've been trying to fact check something, if you've read laterally, if you've gone upstream, if you've done all these things and you still can't tell if it's true, um, it, it probably isn't. You probably need to go back to the beginning and try to find a different source based on what you know now from going through those other moves. So that takes us through Caulfield's four moves. Again, to me, one of the most important things that we can take away from those is reading laterally, trying to understand the network in which a source sort of exists or a publication exists. So I wanna wrap up by just sharing some fact checking and source evaluation resources. Um, and again, this is something that will be shared with you. Everyone I think who uh, will have signed up for this can get an email with the uh, links to these slides, as well as this collection of resources. I'm gonna just show you here what I've got. It is a Google doc. I may add some more um, sources to it. Let me make this a bit bigger so you can see it better. Um, so I have some general sources here, you know, all sides, of course, Google, just Googling it to try to find more information. DuckDuckGo is a uh, sort of more, uh, it's a browser that has more privacy data security options in Google or search engine. Wikipedia, as I've mentioned, I have a few of my favorite fact checking sites here. I use Snopes a lot and factcheck.org, but there is actually a great resource from the Duke Reporters Lab where they have this database of uh, fact checking sites. So if I go into where many of you are, if I look at see what's in Raleigh, um, there is a fact checking project through the News and Observer. So I can kind of take a look to see if there are more local um, resources that I could potentially use. Let's see what this one is, PolitiFact North Carolina. So things that just get sort of um, a little more local in terms of their coverage. Um, and then finally, I have some resources here about those four moves, including a link out to that book, which I highly recommend, um, and some resources about that process of lateral reading. So this has been a ton of content. As I promised, you will get the slides as well as the link to this document. Um, but I would absolutely love to answer your questions that I've seen some coming in. I'm going to stop my share right now. Um, and Thank you. Happy to answer those questions. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Gosh, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, we have a few questions in our um, inbox here, our Q and A section, and um, the first one is uh, the poll you cite offers the perspective of folks about fake news by age. What about education levels? That's a great question. Um, the, uh, there have been studies, I particularly recommend if this is something you're interested in, looking at the Pew um, Research Center. Uh, they do a great deal of work ab about this. The last thing that I read from them, I am hesitant to like speak with lots of uh, conviction on this because I don't remember the details. But the last thing that I remember um, reading from them indicated that there wasn't a lot of difference in terms of education levels. Um, but that's something that I could definitely look into further. Thank you. Um, when you were talking about what happened in 1955, when that was the first use of um, disinformation recorded in the OED, one of the questions that came in was, was this, uh, would McCarthyism be something you would consider in that time frame? Yes, absolutely. And I think that when we think about, um, you know, those, those kinds of, like, when we think about McCarthyism, we think about um, campaigns to discredit people and politicians and, you know, 
friends and neighbors, you know, I think all of that can be really closely tied to disinformation. And one of the things that I think it's important to think about there, I talked several times here in these conversations about fake news and deep fakes about the anxiety that it can create for us. I think if we think about a, a time of McCarthyism, we're thinking of a time of very high anxiety, people are worried about what they're hearing from these potential disinformation campaigns, what, they, what they're hearing, what they're not hearing, there's rumors going around, there's lots of sort of misleading information. Um, so I definitely think that that's something that would have played into that time period and sort of our how our conception of disinformation was created. Thank you. Um, the next question is, are political campaigns the primary source of mis or biased information that this audience is likely to encounter? And how can we discern that political information that we transmit is completely accurate? Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased by that question because I think this is a question that we need to sort of keep in the forefront of our minds is this question to ourselves, how do we know that what we're sharing with other people is completely accurate. Um, I don't know that political campaigns are really the primary source of misinformation or biased information. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of misinformation around you know, the pandemic over the last year that's not necessarily politically or political campaign related. Um, we've seen a lot of misinformation around the COVID vaccine. So I think that we still see this with lots of other issues that have a lot of impact on us, um, like health, you know, things that are related to our health, um, you know, things that are related to sort of local issues that aren't maybe politically driven at all. Um, I think that we hear about fake news um, primarily in the sort of political arena, but I don't think um, that, I, I don't think that um, that's the only place that we're coming across uh, misinformation or biased information. And I think in terms of discerning whether the information that we transmit is mm -hmm. accurate, that's where I would recommend those moves. And one of there's a, a digital literacy expert um, named Claire Wardle. And one of the things that I that she says that I always like is she, she says that if you don't know 100% hand to heart, this is true, don't share it. Um, and I try to keep that in mind um, when I'm thinking about things that I want to share as well. And I would say definitely thinking about call fields like uh, check your, you know, check your emotions, that habit. Um, I would just say you want to do, you want to do that additional research. You want to find other coverage of the same incident. You want to try to use um, lateral reading skills to um, be able to figure out the quality of the information that you're being given. But if you have any doubt, I would say either don't share it or share it with some caveats to say, honestly, I haven't had a chance to fact check this. Um, but I wonder what other people think. This next question um, sort of follows from, from that uh, question you just answered. What would you suggest we do when we find or run across this information, particularly on social media? Yeah, so social media platforms, um, you know, like I said a couple of times in the presentation, you know, one of the concerns that we have is that it's so easy to share this information. But one of the things that helps us balance that ease is that a lot of these platforms um, provide sort of reporting mechanisms. So if you see something and you do think that it's fake, um, you can often report it. Um, and I know I just was hearing about this recently, I think it's Twitter, um, that they have instituted some sort of new rules if you're sort of reported um, and, and it has to be a credible claim that you're providing this information, not just someone who disagrees with you, but if there are credible claims that you're sharing mis or disinformation. Um, and I think it, they have a, it, it was weird to me, it's a five strike rule, which is, you know, I think of three strikes, but apparently there's a, a five strike rule with Twitter now. And if you're reported credibly five times, they can, um, you know, ultimately ban your account. Um, this is different, especially again, when we saw that, like one of those polls that I shared with you about all that anxiety people had about uh, misinformation on social media, uh, the platforms are paying attention to that and they do um, try to sort of change some of their, they, they try to change some of their policies and their sort of user agreements um, to reduce the impact of some of those things. But ultimately, you know, these are, 
we just have to keep in mind that on social media, anyone can share anything. And I think that we have to be extra careful on there. Thank you. Um, we have three questions that have come in from three different people. And they all um, sort of focus on what you do about friends and family that um, insist on believing dubious sources and uh, those who are prone to adopting conspiracy theories. How do we encourage um, them to research them more thoroughly? Or how do we educate people to go beyond social media to get accurate information. So I've just combined, I've just combined three different questions into one, but they all seem to flow in the same direction. Yeah, and that, I think those are great questions. And I also think um, that if I like had had the, the one right magic answer to that, I wouldn't have to be a librarian anymore. I'd be, you know, like out there, um, you know, on, on some major speaking circuits explaining all this. Um, but I think that one of the things that you can do with any kind of difficult conversation like that is to is to leverage the trust that you have with that person. Um, and I think one of the things that you can do is say, you know, hey, it's it's been upsetting me that I've seen you share some of these conspiracy theories or that I've seen you share some of this information when it doesn't seem that you have fact checked it. Can we talk about what your process is? Um, but I do. I think that's. I think that's really challenging. And I think right now, um, you know, we are, from my perspective, and I'm sure from many folks' perspectives, we are at a point of political polarization that I haven't seen in my lifetime until you know recent years. Um, so I think that we're in a really difficult time to have those kind of conversations. Um, but I do think that's you know if you can sort of rely on the relationship that you have, especially with these friends and family members. Um, and in terms of, you know, non-threatening, you know, maybe you could share some, some sources that, that you like that to say that, oh, did you know, this was an interesting article where they talked about what the fact checking process looks like at the Wall Street Journal or something like that, where you can kind of say, oh, here's a method that some people have taken, you know, what do you think about it? And I think you do have to be prepared for people to be offended or, or get angry about that. Um, but I think that, you know, hopefully if you have a good trusting relationship built up with them, they'll know it's coming from, um, from a good and true place. We have a question that is more global in nature. And I know that we're, we are really close on our time. It's 6.01 and I do want to respect uh, your time and those of our attendees. But can you cite any statistics or studies comparing the frequency of fake news originating in the US to the frequency of its origin, uh, origination in China, Russia, Great Britain, or other countries? That is a fantastic question. I saw that come in. I can't right now, but I would love to look into that. That's something that I think I could really benefit from researching um, as well. You know, we have heard quite a bit about it, particularly related to um, Russia. Um, I will say for, for Great Britain, well, so for China, I know that we, I couldn't say any statistics, but what I can say is that there is, you know, a much there's much narrower access to information sources. There's a lot more sort of restrictions um, on uh, what sources are available to people. And I think that that, we could, we could say that that might make it easier for fake news to sort of spread or harder. Um, it just sort of probably depends on the particular topic. But you know, Great Britain, um, one thing that I feel like I can say there is that they, they have a very, um, they have a very strong tabloid culture in Great Britain. And I think we can think about tabloids um, as sort of a form of fake news. Um, I think about like the tabloids that, uh, you know, I came across like going to the supermarket with my mom when I was a kid. And at that time it was Bat Boy. He was on all the, all the tabloids here. Um, and I was fascinated by this sort of like Bat who was also a boy. And I think that in Great Britain, they have a lot of tabloid culture and sort of celebrity tabloid culture, but I'd have to do some research to um, really look at those stats, but I actually would love to do that. Well, thank you. Um, there was one, uh, one last question. What do you think about the magazine, The Week? I have, I'm actually not familiar with that, um, but I can tell you what I would do to learn about it would be to do some lateral reading 
um, and I find out what I could about that source. Well, Jenny Dale, thank you so much for being here today. You've given us a lot to think about and introduced us to four moves and a habit, which I had not heard of before. So I appreciate that. And we look forward to having you back again. Oh, I would love to come back. Thank you all so much for having me. And thank you everyone who's attending. This webinar is being recorded and we'll be posting it on the LWB Wake YouTube channel within a few days. And don't miss um, our next Timely Topics presentation on April 15th, when our guest will be Karen Brinson Bell, the Executive Director of the North Carolina State Board of Elections, discussing experiences from the 2020 election and what we can expect in 2021. Um, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all. <laughs>